White Beard, Big Mom, Kaido, Shiki, Stussy, Gloriosa, Captain John, this guy. In chapter 1096, we recently got a look at the famous Rocks Pirates in all their glory just landing at God Valley and unknowingly walking into one of the biggest L's of their careers. In that crowd, we get a good look at each major member of the crew, along with a brief reaction as they make landfall. Whitebeard takes the calm collected route, Shiki is headstrong, Big Mom is scheming, Kaido is brooding, John is drunk, and... Wait, who the hell is this guy? Better question, why is his face the only one obscured on the whole page? What is Oda hiding here? Brace yourself, dear viewer, because I might have an answer that no one is expecting. The Rocks Pirates were a very big deal, full of a lot of big guys. For you. It was the Rocks Pirates who dominated the seas before Gold Roger ever did. And it's the same crew that would go on to make a lasting, permanent impact on future generations of pirates. You see, every time we get a new look at this story, we find that more and more people we recognize were once a part of his crew. It didn't just stop at the Yonko or throw away names like Silver Axe or Wang Shi, but it extends to people we are already familiar with, like Buckingham Stussy or Gloriosa or Stroysen or even potentially Kurozumi Higurashi. Orochi, who I am does not matter. I have been out of the country. It's been a terrible ordeal. But just look at my face. Gather money and produce weapons. The craftsmen of Wano are highly skilled, and that can be leveraged to gain a massive backing power. That's right, Sonny, the Whitebeard pirates were just playing family. The only son with the blood of Whitebeard, the strongest pirate in the world, is you. The previous empress died of this illness, as did the empress before her. The truth is, I was afflicted as well, but I survived by leaving this land. And these are just a few examples that demonstrate how deep the roots of this crew go. Despite joining rocks together, if not for Stroysen, Big Mom may have never become a pirate in the first place, and Whole Cake Island wouldn't exist. If not for Higurashi, Orochi would have never overthrown Odin and brought Kaido to Wano. Not to mention, three of the former warlords owe a lot to this crew. Weevil, through natural or unnatural means, hopefully unnatural because goddamn, owes his entire existence to two former members of Rocks, Stussy and or Newgate. Buggy partially owes his career to Captain John in the search for his treasure. In fact, had he not, he wouldn't have been arrested, sent to Impel Down, and wouldn't have been given the warlord title after Marineford. Boa owes her life basically to Gloriosa for bringing her back to Amazon Lily, which might have never happened had Gloriosa not fallen in love with someone and left her kingdom. Makes you wonder which man exactly she fell for. It should go without saying that all these characters and each of the four emperors made lasting impacts on the world around them. And all this influence can be traced directly back to the Rock's pirates. Everyone who knows about this was either a part of the crew or part of those fighting against them. If you weren't, then chances are very high that you don't even know Rock's existed with one major exception, this guy. Blackbeard was only a baby at the time of God Valley. He wouldn't have been able to remember anything about it even if he was smack in the middle of the battlefield. And no matter how well read Teach may be, all the records of rocks out there have been wiped, at least we can assume. He's been stricken from the record completely, so researching the crew would be nigh impossible. He probably didn't hear anything about it from Whitebeard since Newgate doesn't like talking about his time with rocks, so now we have a mystery on our hands. Taking over Pirate Island, hunting down rare devil fruits, naming his ship the Sabre of Zebek, not brushing his teeth? Where is Marshall D. Teach getting these ideas from? Who is telling him about the hidden history of 40 years ago? Could it be that there is someone currently on the Blackbeard crew who was once a part of the Rocks crew, who has been feeding Blackbeard this information as a means to groom the next Pirate King and succeed Rox's ambition? I'm not going to waste any more time beating around the bush. 
I believe this shaded figure hiding amongst the Rock's crew is Lafitte, the demon sheriff. Yes, the same Lafitte that is on the Blackbeard Pirates. But Lafitte is too young, but someone would have recognized him by now. But what if that's Wang Shi or Silver Axe? All valid responses to my claim here, and I got no answer to that. Video over. See you next time. Nah, I'm just kidding, but I can't blame you for being skeptical. It's a bit of a leap to make. However, the more research I did into this character and his real-life counterpart, the more I'm becoming convinced that we, and the rest of the pirate world, are being duped by a master manipulator. Matter of fact, today I'm going to do my absolute best to convince you that the man named Lafitte is not who he claims to be. That the identity of Lafitte, his name, his age, and even maybe his face are all a lie. A magician's masquerade, meant to keep the world government in the dark as a new king of the world brews in the shadows. I'm going to show you that the trend of manipulation and influence tied deeply to the Rock's crew doesn't stop at Blackbeard. That while the captain may be propped up as king, leader, commodore, behind the scenes, a dark figure with bad intentions continues to nudge him in a certain direction. Let's start with a bit of background information. We know very few details about Lafitte, but what we do know is enough to cast some suspicion on him. For one thing, of the original four crewmates under Teach, Lafitte is the only one with any kind of history made known to us. The rest have relatively unknown backgrounds, but Lafitte, he was a sheriff from the West Blue who was exiled because of his incredibly violent and cruel tendencies. Doesn't sound like a lot, but that's a lot more than we've gotten with the others. We can only imagine how bad he must have been to be exiled from an entire ocean, but that alone is enough to ring alarm bells considering this is the same sea that Gecko Moria, Gang Beige, and Don Chinjao are from, and those guys aren't exactly known for their weakness or their kindness. But the West Blue isn't just known for their rough and tough pirates, it's also the location of God Valley, a place that would end up defining the career of the Rock's crew, and this crew is likely the greatest influence behind the modern day Blackbeard pirates, obviously. Keep all this in mind, because we have a lot to cover. The events that transpired there took place roughly 38 years ago. Blackbeard was born 40 years ago, and Lafitte is supposedly 41 years old. Of the original founding members of the Blackbeard Pirates, Lafitte is the only one close to this age range, whereas the other three guys are in their 20s. Normally, age disparities like this wouldn't really matter, but Blackbeard's crew isn't exactly normal. Luffy's starting group of five all had ages similar in range, between 17 and 21. Blackbeard's starting five have ages in their mid-20s, with the exceptions of their captain, Blackbeard, and Lafitte, who are just over 40. Of the founding five members, these are the only two who are older than the God Valley incident itself, and Lafitte is the only one from the very same ocean. We'll get back to this later, but first we gotta discuss some other oddities. Another interesting detail about Lafitte is not just when and where he was born, but how he was introduced to us in the story. If the age, the location, and history aren't enough in your eyes to set him apart from the others, then maybe his introduction will. When we first meet Blackbeard in the Jaya arc, we are introduced to his whole crew, or what at first appears to be his whole crew. Blackbeard, Burgess, Van Auger, Doc Q, and stronger. But what we don't know at this point is that Teach has a fifth crewmate we just haven't seen. He gets an entirely separate introduction in a completely different location. And where might that be? The fucking top of Pangaea Castle. Just conceptualize that for a second. Lafitte, a supposedly rookie pirate, casually made his way, by himself, up to one of the most securely guarded places on the planet, on top of a castle, on top of the Red Line, and let himself into a room full of warlords and top-ranking marines who possess observation hockey, all without being noticed by anyone, including fucking Sengoku, Doflamingo, and Hawkeye Mihawk. And this, keep in mind, is done while his entire crew is on Jaya waiting to meet him. Meaning that at some point, Lafitte parted from his crew three quarters of the way back across the Grand Line, or even before, and made a solo trip all the way to the Red Line just to push Teach for the position of Warlord. I don't care what anyone says, this guy is hiding his power level like crazy. Every time I revisit this moment, I always get this weird feeling about Lafitte. Like Oda is pointing to him and saying, pay attention to this guy, he's gonna be important. Even if you don't agree with me so far, which is cool, you gotta admit, this guy is hiding something. Look at this face. Do you trust this face? Would you let this man sell you a car? I didn't think so. So, to restate the thesis here, let's imagine that Lafitte is some kind of former Rox pirate, someone who has intimate knowledge of what Rox's ambitions were and how his crew operated. Wouldn't it make sense for him to be the oldest founding member of the Blackbeard crew? 
Wouldn't it explain the unique introduction Oda gave him? Wouldn't it explain his surprising capabilities? Wouldn't it make sense for the same veteran to play the role of ship navigator since he's navigated the Grand Line before? And that's not the last of my questions. We're doing a whole ass interrogation today. Here's another fun fact. Lafitte is the only member of the Blackbeard Pirates whose devil fruit we don't currently know. It's still a mystery. Is that a coincidence, or is Oda once again separating Lafitte from the rest? Why does Oda give this character this special treatment and air of mystery? It has to be for a reason. By that same token, why is every single member of the Rock's Pirates shown to us here in complete lighting, but this one specific character in the corner is hidden? What does the author not want us to know about this guy's appearance? Not to mention, when you match up Lafitte to this silhouette, it fits surprisingly well. The hat, the hair, the nose, and even what appear to be earrings match up on the panel. The only noticeable differences are the glasses and the lack of makeup or whatever. If Oda's trying to cover something up, it might be because we've seen who this guy is before, and I can't think of many other people who fit the bill. You might be saying, how could Lafitte have been a Rock's pirate if none of the Marines here recognized him and if he's only 41 years old? I'll admit, I had to use a bit of imagination, but I think the answer is ultimately pretty simple. He faked his death and took up a new identity. Let's revisit the first few details we discussed. God Valley was in the West Blue. Lafitte is from the West Blue. If the Rock's pirates fell at God Valley 38 years ago, and whoever Lafitte used to be known as faked his own death at this time, it would stand to reason he remained in the West Blue and laid low for a period of time, before taking up his new career as a sheriff there and establishing this Lafitte identity. And since news of him would only make headway much later, just as Teach maintained a bounty of zero for most of his career, any intel on this man's past would be very inaccurate or outright fabricated. His new age being within a few years of the God Valley incident, just as his new identity presumably spawned from its aftermath, just seems to make sense to me. I admit, the legwork would be on Oda to explain away the intel we got from Lafitte's Viver card, but faking your name and age is something pretty much anyone could do, it's not really that complicated, I mean, fake IDs and all that, so I wouldn't put it past McLovin here. What kind of a stupid name is that, Fogel? What, are you trying to be an Irish R&B singer? Have you actually ever met anyone named McLovin? Lafitte. No, that's why you picked a dumb fucking name. Fuck you. Give me that. All right. You look like a future pedophile in this picture, number one. Number two, it doesn't even have a first name. It just says Lafitte. What? What name? What name? What, who are you, Seal? This may still be a stretch for you, and I totally get it. But what really sold me on this idea, as I researched more and more, were the connections to the real pirate from our very real history by the name of Jean Lafitte. Known as the Terror of the Gulf, Lafitte was a French pirate and privateer who did most of his business in the Gulf of Mexico during the early 1800s. His life was quite eventful. He ran a big smuggling operation out of New Orleans and was involved in various trades that extended beyond piracy. He and his boys were hired guns for the US, paid and awarded directly by Andrew Jackson. At one point, he was a spy for the Spanish during the Mexican War of Independence. He later founded his own colony named Campeche that grossed millions of dollars in stolen goods. There's even a rumor that he rescued Napoleon fucking Bonaparte from exile and they lived out the rest of their days in Louisiana. Probably not true, but that's the thing. There's a lot of rumors surrounding this guy. The weirdest thing about Jean Lafitte is that both his early and late life is obscured in mystery. What do I mean? Well, it's not entirely clear where he was born. Some sources believe that he was born on what is today known as Haiti, others believe he was born in France, but good luck figuring out which city. There's like 15 possibilities. Some contemporary accounts suggest that he was born in Ordunia, Spain, and others believe he was born in Westchester County, New York. Much of his early life was possibly spent on the sea, but what is clear from all this is that nobody knows where exactly this guy came from. And it doesn't stop there. Even more interesting is that, guess what? Nobody knows where and when this guy died. I'm not kidding. Go to his Wikipedia page and you'll see two completely separate dates and locations of death listed, 53 years apart. Once again, he either died at 42 years old or at 95 years old. Are you starting to notice some similarities to what we've been talking about today? But you guys know me, I wouldn't tell you this for nothing. Believe it or not, it gets even crazier. Scroll down further and you'll find a section on his legacy. I am not making this up. The real Lafitte is actually thought, with evidence supporting it, to have faked his death. 
It's actually one of the most famous things about him. This isn't just a crackpot theory, it's a well-documented and commonly believed idea that Jean Lafitte faked his death, and part of this is where the Napoleon rumors came from in the first place. Some thought he was killed by his own men, some thought he changed his name and vanished forever, and researchers failed to find any authentic records of his death. It turns out, he most likely changed his name to Lorenzo Ferrer in 1823. Research into this idea actually turned out to hold some truth to it, and it seems like he moved to Mississippi, spending his remaining decades there. The Mason Lodge in Lincolnton, Mississippi has in their possession a sword dated back to the 19th century with J.N. Lafitte inscribed on the blade, lending credence to the theory. There's even a gravestone for him under his fake name Lorenzo, but interestingly enough, the name on his gravestone is misspelled to include a D. Yeah. One thing is for certain, however. The life Lafitte left behind was one of legend, and has left historians speculating ever since. This was a man of unclear origin who led a successful career at the top of the pirate world, who fought on various sides of various wars, and ultimately faked his own death and lived out his remaining new life off the radar. Not at all unlike the story I'm suggesting for One Piece's Lafitte. But, but, but wait, there's one final cherry on top of this history lesson. And if you watched my Real Life Pirate Influences video, you might know where this is going. See, there isn't just one Lafitte, there were two. Jean Lafitte had an older brother, Pierre, who was also a famous pirate. Pierre was not as widely known as his brother, but he was the face of their operation, due in part to his wit and charm. He was very good at winning people over, almost in that same sort of charming way this guy handles negotiations. So while Jean Lafitte handled most of the pirating, Pierre Lafitte would handle the sales and business afterward. They were a package deal, you could say. So now we have a One Piece character based off of not one, but two people at the same time. One of which famously faked his death and his identity. And if you don't believe Oda would go this far in his research, I would strongly challenge that idea by pointing to the very crew Lafitte is a part of. It's a crew filled to the brim with historical references, led by a guy named Teach, aka Blackbeard, straight up. Oda didn't just pick names out of a hat, he regularly calls back to real pirate history. And this should be no exception. Have I sold you yet? Maybe not. In that case, let's talk about Lafitte's role aboard the ship. Do you know what his title on the Blackbeard Pirates is? Chief of Staff. This is a role that doesn't have a specific numerical spot in the hierarchy, but it kinda does. It's basically one of the highest ranks aboard any crew. The Chief of Staff, also referred to as Staff Officer, basically serves as the bridge of communication between the captain and everyone beneath him. If you had to pick a number, it usually falls in the number three spot under the first mate. But in some cases, such as with Sabo, the Chief of Staff is actually the number two spot, just under the leader. Kabaji, for example, is Buggy's Chief of Staff, positioned under Buggy and Moji. Same goes for Chess, who was third in line after Wapol and Kuromarimo. But make no mistake, they have a lot of power, especially in decision making. You'll see what I mean in a bit, but even though the Chief of Staff isn't always second in command, in special cases, they are left to handle the decision making. In Blackbeard's case, for example, Burgess is the first mate, and this could be due to various things such as their personal relationship or his raw strength, but I don't think this meathead would be the go-to guy for strategy. Lafitte seems to be the closest to the captain regarding decision making and enforcing his authority, despite being the Chief of Staff. When Pizarro threatens to become captain instead, Lafitte casually suggests killing him. When crewmates forget to refer to Teach by his proper title, Lafitte corrects them. When they meet Aokiji, it's Lafitte that is whispering into Teach's ear about stealing his devil fruit. He's the devil on Blackbeard's shoulder, the voice behind him making strategic suggestions. This position holds a lot of weight, on some crews more than others, and to top it off, he's their navigator too, meaning he's not only in charge of the staff, but also in charge of their literal journey. He's the guy responsible for getting them from place to place. Combine all of this, and you have a man who plays arguably the most critical role in the whole Blackbeard fleet next to the captain himself. Let's turn our attention for a sec toward the Doflamingo pirates, who also have a chief of staff of their own, Treble. Treble, the same guy who ran his own gang before meeting Dofi, the same guy who manipulated Doflamingo as a child, gave him his devil fruit and helped coordinate his rise to power over the years, propping Doflamingo up as king. Treble was his chief of staff, the guy who ran things behind the scenes and gave Dofi the political and strategic backing needed to guide his captain to the top. 
This unassuming pile of snot was actually the evil old sage pushing and enabling Doflamingo towards his path of bloodshed, and it remains one of my favorite twists in the Dressrosa arc. And let's not forget how often we can point to Dressrosa as a microcosm for the One Piece world at large. It's filled to the brim with foreshadowing that has slowly come to play out ever since. So transplanting this same idea onto the Blackbeard pirates, if Lafitte was a member of Rocks, faked his death, and later met Blackbeard, it may have been Lafitte who placed a lot of these Zebec-centric ideas in his head. Just like Treble, this man would become Chief of Staff and help enforce the new order he helped prop up under his new captain. I'm not suggesting that Teach isn't responsible at all for his own planning, he definitely is, just as Dofi masterminded a lot on his own, but there is almost an undeniable influence at play in the background, course correcting both their ambitions. It may be Doflamingo who has the reins now, but it was Treble who gave him the reins in the first place. It may be Teach who holds the title of Emperor today, but I think it was Lafitte who put the idea in his his head. Even less hard to believe when you remember that he also has some kind of hypnosis related abilities. If you're a believer of the idea that Teach had a powerful devil fruit ability he's kept secret this whole time, from before he even got the Yami Yami, then the question I'd follow that up with is, where did he get this fruit? Could this have been one of the fruits given up as prizes at God Valley? One that Lafitte snatched up and took with him last minute just as the rest of the crew planned? Some of those prizes are still unaccounted for. Something to think about. Ultimately, it's anyone's guess, but in my eyes, it might be Lafitte's manipulative, strategic, and ruthless nature that has helped Blackbeard move up the ladder so fast. Quite fitting of a staff officer, wouldn't you say? I want to close out this video with a final segment speculating on some possible devil fruit powers that Lafitte may have. Keep in mind, this is the most up in the air part of this theory because it could be so many things, but I thought it'd just be fun to discuss the possibilities. There's a few already out there, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them because they aren't my ideas, but they're worth mentioning since they've floated around the internet for a while. We know that Big Lafitte can do a few things. Move around silently, hypnotize people, and turn his arms into wings. This has led to a bunch of ideas, such as Lafitte having a few mythical Zoan fruits. Some theories believe he has the Harpy fruit, explaining the wings and the hypnosis. This also has a lot of overlap with the idea that he's eaten the Siren fruit, which for all intents and purposes, isn't very different from a Harpy. This would have been foreshadowed as a concept in One Piece through Monet, who was designed to look like a Harpy artificially. Other theories predict that he has the mythical Angel Zoan, since his wings kind of look like angel wings. However, this one I'm against because angels typically have wings on their back, rather than being substituted for arms. Any theologists in the comment section feel free to correct me on that. Uh, but we also have two entire races of angel-like beings, so it all just kind of feels redundant to me. Allow me to throw a hat in the ring though. For one thing, hypnosis isn't an entirely devil fruit related ability. In fact, characters without devil fruits have been using it well before we ever saw it connected to devil fruit powers. Django specialized in hypnotism, and Miss Golden Week also fought primarily by using paint as a medium for hypnosis. If anything, this ability has been established more than others to be something unique from Devil Fruits, and maybe even from hockey, making it yet another skill to be called upon. And regardless of Lafitte's Devil Fruit powers, hell, even if he didn't have one at all, I wouldn't put hypnosis past him. His entire aesthetic is very strongly magician-themed. Mentalism is one of the most popular types of magic out there, centered around playing tricks on the mind, and even purporting to read minds, such as the whole think of a number or think of a card and I'll guess it stick, or reading a crystal ball. It requires a lot of charisma and a deep psychological understanding to perform effectively. And I couldn't think of a closer fit for this archetype than Lafitte. He has this tap dancing, cane twirling, rabbit out of a hat pulling aura to him, taken right out of the early 20th century, and his entire look fits the likes of famous mentalists such as Alexander the Crystal Seer, for example. Kind of reminds me of another magician, Hisoka from Hunter x Hunter, even if just a little bit. So while I don't want to rule hypnosis out of his devil fruit abilities, I do think it's very likely likely a part of his natural skill set. A callback to his magician influences. It also shouldn't be necessary at this point to mention how fitting it is that this magician type character may have performed a disappearing act 38 years ago. So my focus is primarily on his ability to sprout wings and fly. People often call back to his bird-like nature, the way his face looks almost reminding them of owls. Owls are also known for being deathly quiet, making them undetectable by their prey until it's too late. And while the owl idea is cool, and rather fitting, I can't see much coming from a basic owl-related ability. Not much worth hiding there. Remember, this ability is the last of the Blackbeard crews that we're learning. Because of this, I'm led to believe Oda's hiding it because its power is integral to explaining a lot of Lafitte's backstory. And we're not quite ready for that yet. But let's not do away with the owl thing completely. There's a mythical creature known as the Strix. 
a demon from ancient Europe, described as owl-like in appearance, often with pale or gray plumage, sometimes with the head of a human. They have piercing eyes and are thought to feed off the blood of humans and infants to the point that their beaks would be stained red. I know, gruesome stuff. In addition, they're thought to be harbingers of chaos and war, and they had such a terrifying reputation that at some point the word Strix was even used as a curse word. Now, the roots of the word have gone on to describe the actual scientific classification of of owls, creatures from the Strigidae family and the order Strigiformes. Additionally, and here's where it gets interesting, Strix feathers were thought to be an ingredient used in magic. In some old stories, their feathers are used to create hypnotic love potions and rejuvenating elixirs. Strigis, a word derived from Strix, became used as a term for witches or women who practiced magic, and the Strix's name would be invoked to place magical curses upon people. So now we have Lafitte, an extremely brutal demon sheriff, a magician by appearance, a messenger for Blackbeard who masterminds an entire war as a direct result of his negotiations, who looks like an owl with sharp eyes, a pale face, and red lips. And we have the Strix, a malevolent demon who fed on humans in a terribly violent manner, a harbinger of war, used heavily in magical incantations, complete with a piercing stare, pale feathers, and a bloody red beak. If that weren't enough, this creature is commonly associated with vampires, a mythical creature that we now know for sure existed on the rock's crew through Stussy. So with Stussy as a female vampire, Lafitte could have been a male counterpart in the form of a Strix. Why would this power be hidden from us? My thought process is that the Strix is tied heavily into the altering of Lafitte's identity, reason being that these creatures are believed to be shapeshifters. Unlike vampires who are undead in nature, the Strix is created through a metamorphosis of a living being. Sometimes it's a powerful witch in disguise, other times it's an unfortunate person forcibly transformed through a dark ceremony or some kind of divine punishment. In other words, this creature's abilities may have played a central role in the creation of Lafitte's new identity. After all, if he faked his death, then he wasn't reborn like a vampire would be, but simply metamorphosed into a new person. It may have been at God Valley that this happened, for all we know. He grabbed a fruit for himself and an extra one for the road, and after eating the fruit, his eyes changed to an owl's, removing the need for any glasses, and changed his skin to a deathly pale with red lips, making him look just different enough to pass as a new person. Last point. I wondered for a bit if this guy with the four arms in the background was the same guy in the bottom corner we've been discussing today. I figured someone would bring this up. But upon closer analysis, the hat is a bit different. It sports a curved brim like a bowler or derby hat, which is not enough to cover the top of someone's face like we see here with this larger, flat-brimmed hat. He's lumped into the background with this no-name dude here as well, giving me the impression that he's not meant to be in focus at all and plus it would make no sense to silhouette a guy you're clearly showing in the panel above. If that weren't enough, we actually see this same guy as a zombie over in Thriller Bark, meaning that whoever Forearms was is now long dead and gone. This presents the possibility that either this was a completely separate person from this guy, or that this whole video is completely fucking wrong. Take your pick, I don't really care. But assuming that this no-name guy is completely unrelated to this silhouette, the possibilities suddenly become a lot crazier. The sky's the limit. For all we know, this mystery figure could have been Rox's first mate, another name wiped from the history books, and just like Rayleigh found and trained Luffy to succeed Roger's legacy, Lafitte found and prepared Blackbeard's path to Rox's empty throne. So that's pretty much it. In my eyes, I'm gearing up for one of the most insane reveals of the story, that Lafitte has been the treble to Blackbeard's Del Flamingo, that much of the journey Teach has gone through has been at least partially overseen or influenced by the words and actions of this mysterious Rock's pirate, who now passes himself off as the Demon Sheriff. Lafitte, the man who faked his own death, is now seeing the Will of Zebek return in full force, and this time, there's no Gold Roger to stop them. This time, he'll be the right-hand man of the Pirate King, or, if fate allows, the new king of the world. Thanks for watching yet another theory of mine today, folks. It's a bit shorter than some of my other ones, but my goal was to be as straight to the point with this one as I could. I hope I sparked some questions and theories in your mind today, because honestly, this has been one of my favorite ideas to research. There's even more places we could go with this, including power scaling Lafitte for real, figuring out his previous name, timelining his relationship with Blackbeard, and maybe finding any ulterior motives. But for now, I'll leave you guys with this and see where people take it. What do you think about this theory? Do you agree? Disagree? Any other ideas for his devil fruit powers? What do you think his name used to be? Let me know in the comments below. And please, if you enjoyed this video, make sure to like and subscribe to keep the music alive.
Thanks again for watching the show because I enjoyed putting it on. Until next time, have a great day, a good night, and a wonderful romance dawn. I think his name was Pee Wee, by the way.